some new teachers from Chile, from Colombia, Uruguay, the USA, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Paraguay, New Zealand, and Ecuador. Thank you very much for joining join us. And uh, today we have the presentation of Dr. Stephen Krashen. Well, every time when I have to introduce Dr. Krashen, I always make a mistake. So I hope not to make any mistake today, but I'm sure that he's going to find uh, some, some mistake. Dr. Krashen is a linguist, educational researcher, political activist, um, professor at the University of Southern California, coffee lover, and the champion of a wave lifting contest in Venice Beach, California in 1976. Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. Okay, Professor Krashen received a PhD in linguistics from the University of California in Los Angeles, 1972. And he has more than 540 publications contributing to the fields of second language acquisition, bilingual education, and reading. Uh, he is known for introducing various hypotheses related to second language acquisition, including the acquisition learning, the input, the monitor hypothesis, the affective filter, and the natural order hypothesis. Okay, so uh, Dr. Krashen has prepared for us his third talk. And um, I would like to say thank you for being so generous and so kind. And I have to be honest and to tell you that it's so hard to find someone so big and so simple at the same time. So please, people, enjoy this presentation. Thank you very much. I can do that. Good. Thank you. Beautiful introduction. Thank you. No mistakes this time. That was perfect. Just right, Est. My father was at the contest when I won. Isn't that exciting? My father was there helping me. Ah, great. Okay. I want to do two things today. I promised to talk about the academic composing process. So those of you who like to do these things, you can do 500 publications too. I hope you will. Uh, but I also want to talk about how we make progress, how we work, what the publications are all about. And that's the first half of the talk. How do we make progress? We make progress using an interesting word, theory. You've heard the word theory? Theory has several definitions. How do I get the bell from stopping? The one that says all the people are in the room. Ah, uh, mute. I'll do that. No, that doesn't work. I just want to stop the bell. Okay. Now there it goes again. Okay. I'll just work through it. Okay. We do something called theory. Theory for most people means something you just made up. Oh, it's only theory. Like you got a, stayed up late last night, you got some cheap wine and you drank wine till two o'clock in the morning and you came up with some ideas, you wrote them down and this is my theory. No, that's not what I mean. Theory is very, very ser serious. Theory is a set of what's called hypotheses. Let me define a hypothesis. Hypothesis is a guess or a prediction and you see if the prediction is right. A man named Karl Popper, P-O-P-P-E-R, <clears throat> was very important in science. And he said something that I think is 50% right and 50% wrong. It's a very important statement and I respect his view, but it's half and half. He says in science, you can't prove anything. You can only get supporting evidence. So you see in the newspapers, scientists have proven that no they can never prove anything you can get lots and lots of data evidence but you can never see all the cases but you can disprove very interesting albert einstein said no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right a single experiment can prove me wrong let me give you an example let's say i'm a linguist which i used to be and let's say I have a hypothesis. Linguists love these hypotheses. I claim that all languages in the world have pronouns. Lang pronouns are universal. This is a very Chomskyan idea, it's very important. 
It means that when the child starts acquiring language, the child expects pronouns, and that makes it easier to acquire. Then I've made my reputation on pronouns. I stayed up late one night and I counted all the languages in the world, 4,612. I just made that up. And they all have pronouns. Have I proven that all languages in the world have pronouns, that pronouns are a universal? Actually, no. Uh, there may have been some languages that are lost, okay? Like pre-proto-Etruscan or something that we don't have any records. Maybe it didn't have pronouns. And maybe a language will develop somewhere and it won't have pronouns. We don't know. So we can never prove it. All we can say is it's an interesting hypothesis. We can disprove. Then it happens. I've made my career on pronouns. I'm very famous. When I go to conferences, people say, there goes the pronoun man. I'm very famous for pronouns. And then it happens. Three graduate students, age 24, 27, and 29, go to a small country and they find a language spoken by five people, all over 95 years old, no pronouns. What happens to my hypothesis? It's disproven. What happens to me? My career is ruined. My hypothesis is wrong. There's a counter example. People start, and I, I no longer get invitations. I'm not popular anymore. People think, how could he have been so stupid, all right? So one language without pronouns disproves. What do we do in science, according to Popper? You make hypotheses and you try to disprove them. The ones that survive, okay, but they can be disproven to tomorrow. So science is a very, very dangerous game. What will happen to you if you start publishing papers like I do, some of you are doing this already, and you present cases while you write, pronoun case, whatever, someone can always say, I'm not convinced. I'd like to see more evidence. This is what we call in English slang, English slang a cheap shot. Anybody can do this. You can always say it about anybody. Let's see some more cases. Okay, or they say, and this is really nasty, they say, oh, it's just theory. No, well, theory is all we have. Now, where do we get our hypotheses? Anywhere. It doesn't matter. In fact, you might be interested in knowing that the major source of hypotheses among scientists is their own work. They review their own work and new ideas come, new hypotheses. There are three places where we can do, where we can do uh, we can find out if the hypotheses are correct and get new ideas. Three sources. The first is experiments. You know how they work. If you want to find out if one method is better than another, you have two groups. One group gets the new method, comprehensible input. The other gets a grammar method. You give them pre-test, post-test, you compare them. And if one group is better, that confirms the, the hypothesis, one of the hypotheses. Well, this is a good way of working. It's not the only way. The public thinks you must do an experiment. I have a lot of respect for other ways of doing research. Case histories and anecdotes. Stories people tell you. I listen very carefully for these. Now, experiments are better. The problem with anecdotes and case histories, there can be alternative explanations. Um, a, a colleague of mine, Ken Smith, um, uh, works in Taiwan. And he was in Taiwan last year, visiting people, seeing people. And he stopped off for the night at a hostel, like a cheap hotel. And in the cheap hotel, you share a room with somebody else or two or more people. And he got into the room. Now, uh, Ken speaks Chinese, but the guy he met in his room was Chinese, Taiwanese. And he started, this guy started speaking to him in English, in good English. And he said, I'll take the upper bunk, you take the lower bunk, is that okay? Okay, fine. What's your name? He said, my name is Felix. And Ken said, is the, are you named for Felix the cat? Cartoon character. He says, no, Felix the baseball player, known as King Felix. It turns out this guy, interesting case history, Ken published this, is quite nice, is a baseball fanatic. He watches American baseball all the time on television, 
and he has acquired English from listening to the broadcasts. Now, this is interesting. This supports Krashen's ideas. It's comprehensible input, okay? But maybe we don't know the whole story. If you're a critic, you can always say, maybe he studied a grammar book every night before he went to bed. Maybe he had 10 years of English class. You cannot eliminate alternative explanations if you use only stories and anecdotes. Experiments are really the best way of doing it. But case histories and anecdotes are important. It is a test that a hypothesis must, was, must pass. If we meet people and we think comprehensible input is right, and we meet people who speak another language very well, and they didn't get input, they only did study, then the hypothesis is in trouble. Now, Karl Popper makes life very difficult for us. He says, if you have an experiment and you get the, uh, the expected result, that's only confirming evidence, it doesn't prove it, it can never prove it, and it doesn't matter how many times you do it. You can replicate it, like Einstein said, you can replicate it a hundred times and it doesn't matter. Well, I, I want to put in a good word for replication. Replication is a very good thing. I, I've read a lot about replication and uh, in the journals, they don't really like replication. If you do a study, you replicate it, you get the same results again and again, they're not impressed. You've got to do something completely different. But replication is important. And those of you who are interested in a career in research, begin with replication. Very good way of learning how to do it. And you do a service. If you can replicate a result, your result or someone else's, it makes it more likely that the hypothesis is true. So those of you who remember your statistics class, uh, both of you, okay, uh, let's say you get an experimental result and it says P is less than 0.05 or P equals 0.05. That means it's a good result. And another one says P is less than 0.2. Not so good. But if you combine them, there are formulas for this. The P is less than 0.03. It makes it more likely that the result is real. So I am in favor of replications, even though journals are not impressed. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Now that's Popper. Popper says it doesn't matter if you replicate. It doesn't matter if you do it again with a different group. It still doesn't prove it. Let me tell you what Emerson said. And some of you who've studied English literature know who Emerson is. He's a poet, a fiction writer, brilliant man. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. The value of a principle is the number of things it will explain. That is also true, in my opinion, especially when we find the same results in very different areas. Uh, for example, um, there's a phenomena in second language acquisition called the silent period. I did some research on the silent period and I discovered that most people think I invented it. No, I didn't. I used other people's work. I just uh, said this is consistent with my work. In the beginning, people don't talk very much. And while they're quiet, they're getting more input, getting more input. So it's a good thing to allow it to happen. And when we force people to speak, we make them very, very nervous and it doesn't help them. So interesting. I did some reading and I discovered the silent period exists for animal language. Wow. This is animals discovering signals that they use with each other. For example, uh, monkeys, a certain branch of monkeys, uh, vervet monkeys, they learn alarm signals. If a predator comes, one signal means you should hide in the bushes. Another signal means you should climb a tree. Depends on the predator who help you escape. Silent period. Young monkeys simply watched what their elders did, what the older monkeys did. They would listen to the signal, look around. Listen, and then a few months later, they could start to produce them in the correct way. Uh, also, what's good for us is when a hypothesis does things within our own field that you didn't expect it to do. Uh, the work on language acquisition, my work, began in the 1970s with adults doing uh, second language. And all my subjects were university students in New York. <clears throat> and I thought we did it with grammatical aspects, and that's all we had. And then we discovered it was true of children learning grammatic, acquiring grammatical aspects. 
we discovered it was true of first language and second language. Then we discovered it was true of vocabulary. We discovered it was true of spelling. You acquire spelling, not by study, but comprehensible input, et cetera, et cetera. That to me should show you the hypothesis is really strong and it's probably correct. Karl Popper would say it doesn't matter. It doesn't add any strength. I think it does. There is something going on there. Now, if you try to replicate and it doesn't work, you didn't get the results you wanted, don't be upset. First, it could be that you're wrong and that's okay. We'll talk about being wrong in a moment. But what you should do first is find out why it didn't come out. You may find you may come up with a better hypothesis. Long ago, <clears throat> again in the 70s when this first came, I had this idea that there was a natural order of acquisition of English grammatical morphemes. We found it for adults, we found it for children, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then one of my colleagues at UCLA, Dan Larson Freeman, did her doctoral dissertation and she couldn't get it. She gave people tests and they didn't have a natural order. Therefore, it's all wrong. I looked at the data. When you give people natural communication, you have it. When you give people a grammar test, the natural order is no longer there. And that was the beginning of the monitor hypothesis. What are the conditions where people use grammar? What happens? So going deeper, not simply accepting that I was wrong, but looking for an explanation. That was very important. It led to a deeper hypothesis. Well, let's talk about being wrong and making mistakes. We do them all the time. There's a song in children's show, Sesame Street. Everyone makes mistakes that I'm done on. Your father and your mother and your sister brother do. Noam Chomsky, great quote. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. Isn't that wonderful? Some people are afraid to have a hypothesis because they're afraid of being wrong. No, that's fine. Let me tell you about John Tate, T-A-T-E. John Tate was a mathematician. He died a couple of years ago in his 90s. He was a specialist in algebra. I know about him. He, uh, Tate was at the University of Texas, and that's where my son went to graduate school and was in the math department. He got his PhD in math. He's a math professor now. Anyway, he told me about John Tate, who is absolutely brilliant in mathematics, one of the best in the world. Someone, went at, someone once asked John Tate, this guy known as a super genius, said, what do you do all day? What's your work day like? Tate said, about one third of the time I'm doing good work. One third of the time I'm making mistakes. And one third of the time I'm wondering, how could I be so stupid? This is absolutely normal. This is what goes on. A good example of this uh, came from a book called Einstein's Mistakes. One of my absolute favorite people in the whole field is a woman named Susan Ohanian. She's an expert in language arts. And I quote her stuff all the time. Her husband is Hans Ohanian, and he's a physicist. I discovered by accident that my son had one of his textbooks. Okay, it's a small world anyway. And Hans, very interesting guy, wrote a biography of Albert Einstein. And it was called Einstein's Mistakes. The Human Failings of Genius. Very good book, let me tell you. He talks about the time when Einstein uh, submitted a paper for publication. It was published on physics, theory of relativity. The next year, he wrote another paper saying last year's paper was wrong. Here's the real solution. The next year, he wrote another paper and said last year's paper was wrong, and he did it again. This is how science progresses. Now, the title of the book was Einstein's Mistakes, and I wrote Susan. Susan sent me a copy because she knew I liked Einstein, and I read it, and I, I said, you know, the book is really good, but Hans Ohanian made a big mistake uh, in the title of the book, Einstein's Mistakes. The book tells us a lot more than Einstein's mistakes. To paraphrase Kepler, the astronomer, it reveals, quote, the wondrous and twisted roads that lead to knowledge. This is the truth. It tells us that Einstein went through the same path that everybody does, back and forth, 
back and forth, okay? Like wandering in the desert before you reach the promised land, which was not linear, they went back and forth. Donald Campbell comments on the fact that people think that it comes really easy. I tell you, I have thousands of publications. Oh, it comes easily for you. Oh no, not at all. Uh, Campbell said, too many potential creators are inhibited by a belief that gifted others solve problems directly. The answers just come. You're just taking dictation from the spirit world from the other side. No, it's back and forth. I have a friend in the linguistics department and I was a grad student. You know, when you finish a paper, you give it to your other colleagues and see how they say you like it. He had a stamp he put on his paper the moment he wrote it. This does not represent my current position. In other words, I'm going to change it. This is wrong. We know it's going to be wrong, etc. Now, where do we get good criticism from other people? Uh, when I was back in grad school, again, in my, in my department, I was in the linguistics department. And what we did was study Chomsky. That's all we did, basically, because his theory had just broken through. And believe me, it was a wonderful education. I learned scientific method, no question, from Chomsky, how to think, how to do science. And we also read, we all read all of Chomsky, all of us, and we read the criticisms of Chomsky. The criticisms of Chomsky that appeared in the journal, we looked at them and laughed. They were so completely wrong. None of them tried to understand Chomsky's theory. They were just interested in attacking, and they hadn't really studied it very well. Chomsky has pointed out that the critics who have caused him to change his mind were his students. His students played a game called the believing game. They tried to understand what Chomsky was doing, and they tried to extend his results not look for errors, but see how far it could go. They found the mistakes, not major, but they were here and there, and they caused a change in the theory. They played the believing game. This is an expression I got from a scholar in uh, writing theory, Peter Elbow, E-L-B-O-W, okay? He wrote an essay that came at the end of his wonderful book, Writing Without Teachers, called The Believing Game and the Doubting Game. We play the doubting game. That's what we're taught. Uh, be as skeptical and as analytic as you can. Find the mistakes. You all know people like that, right? People are just out to find out where you're wrong about everything in your life. Elbow says, in science, the doubting game has a monopoly. But he says, you got to play both. I think the doubting game is fine. I think um, it's a good idea. It's a wonderful way to do science. But you have to also play the believing game. The believing came, Elbow says, allows us to enter into ide ideas. Um, I, when I was at UCLA in the beginning days, when I first, I'm sorry, when I was at USC in the beginning days, we had meetings with UCLA and we had our kind of friendly rivalry. I regard UCLA faculty as the loyal opposition. They were trying to find errors, but they were quite nice and very friendly about it. One of the people there I respect the most was a guy named John Schumann. John Schumann was a new professor at UCLA, or more or less the same age. And he didn't agree with me on a lot of things. He was confused. We had a phone conversation about it, and he said the nicest thing, which I still remember, I would really like to understand your work better. I'd like to kind of crawl into your mind and see this from your point of view. And this is exactly what Elbow recommends. You should say, tell me more about that. I'm trying to see things the way you see them. That was exactly John Schumann. And that is the position I really respect. And I hope I do that with other people's data. Well, this is basically the end of my talk, but I'm gonna give you an appendix to this talk before we go on to the next half. Um, I wanna talk about using old data when you do science, not just new data. Um, if you're a graduate student, the pressure, or a new professor, the pressure on you is to do new studies, get new data, got an idea, let's test it, let's get a grant and divide students in two and blah, 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 and do this. I am very cynical. 
Uh, I was a famous uh, comedian who said, my cynicism is not keeping up with the times. I'm so cynical. And this is my view of this. The reason the university wants you to get new data is so you'll get a grant and they get to keep some of the money and they can spend it on anything they like. I'm very cynical about how things work now. You don't need to do it. I've never gotten a grant. I have never had a single grant. I have never applied for one. I'm never going to do it. First of all, if I'm going to do an experiment, the students are right there and you do it. So it's part of their regular instruction. So you're not wasting their time. But I like looking at old studies. To me, that's the fastest way to learn. Now, Chomsky in the air was an expert in syntax when he worked in the area of phonology sound systems. He worked with a man named Morris Halley. Uh, Morris Halley was one or is wonderful. And uh, he and Noam Chomsky wrote a book together called uh, Sound Patterns of English. As soon as it came out, the day it came out, all of us had a copy. In those days, you could afford new books. Nobody can afford them anymore. And it was in all our classes and we all immediately studied it. Professors went over, is that important? Absolutely brilliant. Now, when, Chomps, when Morris Halley gave a talk on phonology, I've heard about this, I didn't witness it. He brought up some old analyses of sound systems. And someone from the audience said, this is old stuff, we've already gone over this. Can't you give us something new? Halley's response was wonderful. I'm not here to bring you the news. I'm here to bring you the truth. Old data is wonderful. Let's say you have an idea, you're gonna test it in an experiment, and you find an article published in 1921 that answers your question. That counts. That's just like new data. You can use that as evidence. So accidental discovery of old data counts. There's more than just experiments. There's two other ways of working in using the experimental method. One we called secondary analysis, taking old data and reanalyzing it, looking at it again in light of a new hypothesis. Einstein's work was all secondary analysis. Einstein did not have a laboratory. What he did was go over and over research done 15, 20 years ago and come up with new conclusions, etc. Chomsky did the same thing. Chomsky was uh, fascinated by philosophical research on innateness and the mind and all that. And he stayed with it. He wrote a book about Descartes, who was the leader of that field, called Cartesian Linguistics. It happened to me. One of the entertaining <laughs> things, you find a new data, it's entertaining. I love it. Um, I, during my work breaks, when I was working in the library, doing my work, I would go over to what we call the stacks in those days. It wasn't all on computer. We had actual paper journals with articles. And I found a section of articles, research done in the 1890s and early 1900s. Wow, really? And I started reading them just for fun. That's my idea of a good time. I found papers on spelling in English as a first language published in Oh my, a guy named Rice in 1897, Kornman in 1902, and it was all about whether instruction helps spelling. Now, in those days, they didn't have the statistics that we have today. The statistics that we use today, the t-test, the correlations, the chi-squares, all these things you studied once and forgot about, um, that was invented in the 1920s. So what I did with my students, with my student Howard White, again, this was so exciting. We took Rice's data and Corman's data, page after page of data. One group got spelling instruction, the other group didn't. Grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way through. They published all the data. They didn't do statistical analysis because they didn't know how. There were no, there were, all they could do was get the averages. So we, copied down their data and used the university computers. In those days, you had to put everything on cards and all that. And guess what? Rice and Corman were absolutely correct. Instruction made no difference. And we found it in group after group after group. One of the articles, I think Corman's was called The Futility of the Spelling Grind. Uh, 
Spelling is torture and it's a waste of time. So this counts, my friends. This counts as if it were new data. And it's an application of comprehensible input to a new area. Uh, in the article that Howard White and I wrote, we reviewed research correlating spelling and reading, showing that spelling doesn't even come from reading. So this is an example of secondary analysis. I think it's just as important as primary. In fact, it's, it's better because you don't have to do the experiment. It's already done for you. And you honor the work of people who worked so hard in the past. Well, that's secondary analysis. There's something even more exciting. Meta-analysis. Oh my. Meta-analysis. You take a whole bunch of experiments, like 20, 30 different experiments, and you summarize them. Not talking about them. Each experiment gets a number called an effect size. So one group gets comprehensible input, the other gets grammar. And you can take the statistical result and convert it into what's called an effect size. You can get the average effect size of 20 different studies. And you can see how much variation there is. This is very exciting research. Um, the, the area I wanna talk about with this is bilingual education. Bilingual education, the data I looked at are children in the United States who speak English as a second language and they come from Spanish speaking countries, primarily Mexico, but from other countries as well. And half of them in these studies did all English programs. The others did bilingual education, which was not very popular in those days. It didn't make sense. How you give them education in Spanish, how are they gonna learn English? Well, our theory was if they got some background in Spanish, the English would be more comprehensible. And that's what the early studies found. In fact, there was a meta-analysis. There have been two big ones, I'll tell you about them. Anne Willig in 1985 did the first one. And she found the kids in bilingual ed, if you set it up reasonably well, acquired where they had some Spanish, some English in school, both languages. They did better in English acquisition than children in all English programs. My former student, Grace McField, did a, her dissertation on this. It's on ResearchGate. Of course, I like Grace. She's good. She worked with her husband on this. It was very nice. They were wonderful. Um, they found that if the study is set up correctly and everything in it, it's a good method, you get a very strong result in favor of bilingual education. Now, here's what's interesting. My, uh, my former students, Jeff McQuillan and Lucy Say, got together and wrote a brilliant paper. It was called, Does Research Matter? They looked at all the research on bilingual education over 10 years. Then they looked at articles in newspapers and magazines about bilingual education. The research all said bilingual education works. The opinion in the newspapers all said it doesn't work. Does research matter? Well, today the public is still against bilingual education because of common sense. They don't understand the theory of comprehensible input, um, et cetera. So what do we do about it? There are three groups of people who could solve this, <clears throat> who know that bilingual education works or who could find out and could explain it. Number one, first of the teachers who teach in bilingual programs. When I first published my books and papers on bilingual education, the teachers were on my side because they have seen it in their lives. The average researcher, the average newspaper reporter has never spent a day alone in a room with 20 children. They have no idea. The researchers don't know either. It's the teachers who really know. I don't know. I'm one of these ivory tower researchers. Let me tell you, I have taught, but not that much. And I could, become a teacher or stay in the teacher's classroom for three years, I wouldn't know what they know. These are people who spent 20 years, 25 years, 30 years teaching. They've seen student after student and they're dedicated, they work hard, they really get it. But teachers can't help us. You know why? They don't have time. Teachers are overworked like no other profession. They don't have time to think. They don't have time to be with their family. They're exhausted. 
That's the problem. We work them much too hard. My fantasy life is like this. This is my version of a fantasy life. I have weird fantasies. I want education to be like medicine. In medicine, if you get medical journals, someone will publish an article about how we cured this special kind of tooth decay, okay, in a dental journal. Then dentists will write in and they'll say, we tried your treatment and we had seven cases that had this problem of tooth decay. We used the new medication and the salve that you talked about. Seven cases, it worked in five. The other two, there was an allergic effect and maybe you should look at that. They give good feedback because they've seen it all the time. That's my hope. I hope that teachers can tell the researchers what's really going on. You don't have to write a long paper, but a few notes here and there. Right now, it's still impossible because teachers are so unbelievably overworked. Scholars aren't much of a help either. Scholars are used to playing the doubting game. Scol scholars are looking for counter evidence all the time because that's the only thing that society accepts and respects. So you don't get very much help from the scholars who are always looking for problems. And because they're not teachers, they don't see what's going on in classrooms. So this, this has happened to me. There have been places in bilingual education, also in literacy, where it seems not to work. And if you look closely, you find out why, you get a deeper hypothesis. Uh, this happened to me when I was involved in the great phonics controversy, I'm still involved. People just love phonics. They think it's great. You know, uh, this, the line in the bubble is pronounced B, okay? Except in words like bomb. Why? I'll tell you why. Anyway, the scholars are all looking for the easy cases. They're giving people the wrong tests. It turns out that intensive phonics, drilling people on sounds, doesn't really help you learn to read. It helps you pronounce words in isolation. That's all it does. The problem there is that the critics don't look at that. It says reading test, see, they did better in reading. Okay, I'll come back to that. Reporters are not careful because they're not practitioners, they're not teachers. I've got to tell you about my cousin, Carrie, <clears throat> really nice guy, my first cousin once removed, my cousin's son. Um, Carrie got his uh, education in journalism and he's now an entertainment reporter. Isn't that neat? He meets all the movie stars, interviews them on the award show. He's there giving the microphone and all that. But when he finished his schooling, I, I talked about my problems with the media. And he said, let me tell you something, Steve. Reporters think they know everything. As a group, they're very arrogant. They think they've got it. And they don't care what your data says. They don't even know about it. They're going with their feelings. I had an incident like this uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, my wife and I were invited to an evening reception, a small party, with a member of the synagogue, and she invited her friends and a few friends. And one of the synagogue members brought her husband. When I met the husband, shook hands, which I wouldn't do again today, of course, wouldn't go near anybody, um, I recognized his name. He was a newspaper columnist, and he had written columns on education and about bilingual education. And he was completely 100% wrong. So I told him who I was. He didn't recognize my name at all, which I was, it tells you, you know, because I've written a lot about this stuff. I've been in the newspapers, you know, I've been on television talking about bilingual education. My mother was so thrilled. I was attacked in the editorial page in the Wall Street Journal. You know, Krashen has this ridiculous view of this professor, what do they know? And uh, mom was so happy because the Wall Street Journal, they had the most respect for. See, my son is in the Wall Street Journal. Isn't that wonderful? I don't care what they said. Uh, anyway, we talked about this and he had zero respect for academics. He told me about this professor from San Diego State who kept sending him a lot of junk all the time. She kept writing him saying he was wrong. She sent him all her papers and her data. I know this lady. She's actually a real professional. She's very good. And I told this guy that he, he wasn't listening. He didn't care. He said, she's just another nut. She keeps sending me these things. I just throw it out. That's the attitude. Now, 
how are we going to get around this? What is the solution? We have teachers who are overworked. We have scholars who like to play the doubting game. I'll tell you another thing scholars do, which is too bad. What they do is they write long, detailed articles, filled, the ones who support our side, and they send them to each other. They send them to journals that nobody's going to read, and they post them on Facebook, where no one in the world is going to read them. Um, a guy named Hedges talked about this. He says, scholars are kind of doing this on purpose, so they won't be attacked. If you write in what he calls the tortured prose of academics and no one understands them, you can say whatever you want and no one's going to attack you because they don't understand what you're talking about. And if it's completely incomprehensible, they'll think you're really, really smart. So that's what, unfortunately, many of my colleagues do who are supportive of this. I think part of the answer is writing about it. And my, um, my way of doing it is writing letters to the editor to newspapers, really short. It's the only way you can get in. They're not going to take a column from you. And I have found I cannot talk to reporters. They're not listening, which is exactly what my cousin told me. I have broken the world record, I am sure, for letters to the editor submitted, not letters to the editor <laughs> published. Uh, actually, the world record in letters to the editor published is like 3,000. It's this guy who lives in Mumbai, and he writes about everything all the time, like the traffic light doesn't work on this corner. I stick to a certain thing. The average, I've actually I've done pretty well. The average percentage of letters to the editor sub submitted that get published is about 10%. Uh, I'm sorry, about 5%, one out of 20. I've gotten about 10%, which is pretty good. In bilingual education and in phonics, nearly zero. We did make progress once and that's when I found the answer. And that's where I need the help of some of you. I wrote a letter to the editor on a topic. I don't remember what, it's probably phonics. And Jeff McQuillan wrote a letter, my former student. Lucy Say wrote a letter, my former student. We did not consult each other. My, we said the same thing though. My letter got published because I am sure because of their letters. They're very impressed when more than one letter says similar things. And the letters are obviously from different people. When I write a letter to a newspaper and it doesn't get in, which is most of the time, but someone else's letter gets in that says a similar thing, I feel good. That means I was part of the reason that that point of view was published. I think it's a good idea to do letters. I think it's a wonderful idea. It helps everybody. One letter won't make much of a difference but eventually I hope it will. First of all, if you write short letters, you learn how to say things quickly. You learn how to state your case and walk away and state it clearly. It's good if you have arguments talking to people while you're in an elevator or on an escalator where the time is very short. Like when I started arguing with people on bilingual ed, casual, I would just say one sentence. How, what would you say if I told you that when we compare the two, the people in bilingual ed do better in English. They do better on tests. I say, oh, really? That's all I say in the letter. How would you feel if I told you that people at heavy phonics instruction only do better in pronouncing words out loud? They don't do better on tests of, of reading comprehension. What would you say if I told you, these are separate conversations, that people who read a lot for pleasure do better on reading comprehension and they do better on phonics. So these arguments work and I've found the core arguments by writing these letters and going over and over, revising, revising. So I think we do have a chance if we will really hit the public hard with letters. I hope teachers will tell the world what they know, but I know it's tough now because I know they're overwhelmed. I don't think scholars are gonna rush to my defense because they're too busy writing incomprehensible papers so they can get tenure in their universities. But that's where I see the solution. That is my preliminary talk on how science works. And I want to talk about the composing process now, but let's take a one minute pause while I drink a little bit more coffee. Secreto exito, okay? Then we can come back and do this, okay? And I have some conjectures and principles of how to publish papers and make a contribution. Okay. 
I want to summarize what the principles are and just walk through them. How to be a successful writer of research. Number one, don't be in a hurry. Don't overwork. Number two, and this is going to sound funny. I will explain it. Write before you read. Very interesting. I've been talking about reading. Could change that a little. Peter Elbow, write right away. It's easier to write now when you know less. You know, you want to get through. You want to get done with the paper. The way to get done is to pretend you have no deadline. If you're worried about the deadline, you will be frozen. You'll be immobilized. You'll be so worried about finished by the deadline that you can't think straight. You have, this is hard to do. You have to pretend you have all the time in the world. And the only thing you need to worry about is the sentence that you're worried that you're writing right now. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. Don't be afraid to take breaks. We talked about incubation last time, how important it is. Okay. Elbow says, write before you start reading, write down ideas about the topic. Don't just start reading. If you start reading, say I'm going to write a paper on spelling. Oh, I'll read all the spelling research first. Don't do that. First, write down what you think is going on. Be prepared to be wrong. And remember, I said this last time, the first draft of anything is shit. Don't worry if it's good. Don't worry if it's bad. Get some ideas down. Then when you start reading, you know what you're looking for. You're testing your hypotheses. I do this all the time. If I'm going to write a paper on anything, I first say, what is my view on this? What do I think? Don't be afraid of being wrong. Read after you have an idea where you're going and read only the things that pertain to your idea. Now, should you keep up with the literature? Uh, make sure you read everything that comes out. Absolutely not. Read only what you need to read to solve the problem you're working on now. If you read to keep up with the literature, you're going to forget it in 10 minutes. Um, in the old days when we had journals, print journals, which I still have a lot of them there, and books where I have notes in the margin, uh, I can read an article that I felt I should read and make notes in the margin. I'll pick it up again two weeks later. I see my own notes. I don't understand them anymore because I'm not worrying about this topic anymore. It's gone. That's what happens if you read something because you feel you should, not when you're trying to solve a problem. If the reading that you're doing pertains to the problem, you remember it forever. I only had to read Oliver Kornman once and I understood completely because it was a hypothesis I was very, very interested in. The paper was published in one of the reading journals by a guy named Bazeman, brilliant. It was about physicists and how they read. He, in those days, again, they went to the library and they looked at the books on the shelf to see what was there. And they looked at journals, but they only made copies of articles they needed right now. If there was an article that was interesting, they didn't look at it. I'll look at it later when I'm going to work on this topic, maybe. They only read what they needed to read right now. All if you're doing a paper on motivation, just read about that. Don't read things, but I feel guilty. You know why? I feel the presence of my fifth grade teacher behind me who's saying, Stephen, read every article. It might be on the test. Resist the temptation. Okay. Uh, what happens too, we talked about revision last time. This is a good application. When you have plans, I said it's good to have an outline, you remember. It's good to have flexible plans and be willing to change your plans. That's what people do. They go read the new papers, then they change their ideas right there. It's constant revision 
from looking at new data, confirming, not confirming. Here's something that I found particularly interesting. Creative people, where do they get their ideas? They get most of their ideas from their own work, not from other people. I have found this is true with me. I do a lot of casual reading, looking through things. What I'm looking for is not new ideas. I'm looking for confirmation of my own ideas. Those are the ones you remember. Those are the ones you're going to use in your own writing. Well, uh, let's go down to the next topic of my advice of how to be a great scientist. The next one, use existing sets of data. I briefly mentioned this. You want to save time. You want to save people's time. Every time you do an experiment and you have subjects and you pay them to do this and that, you're using up someone else's time, especially if you're not paying them, in my opinion. Try to use existing data and you won't have to be wasting people's time. Try to use tools developed by other researchers. You don't have to discover it all yourself. Uh, when I do a study and there's previous studies, I will use the same tests they did. If they use the t-test with correlated samples, I'll try to do that so I can compare with them. If there's an option, I'll do exactly what they did. It's not cheating, it is honoring your colleagues and they will be thrilled that you use their method that you compared it to their results here is a brilliant breakthrough that are called unobtrusive measures i'll give you a, a classic example and i'll give you a brand new one an automobile this is from the book unobtrusive measures great book there's an automobile dealer in the city of chicago who dealt in Chevrolet's American kind of car. And he wanted to know what radio station he should advertise on. Well, how do you find out? Uh, do you do a survey? Do you go ask people, uh, make an electronic device so you can monitor? Do you ask them where they found out? Very easy. He went to his own shop where the mechanics were, were fixing Chevrolet's. They were sitting there. He said, look at where the radio dial is set. Then you'll know what radio station Chevrolet drivers are listening to. Just see if this is on radio station 91.2, just write that down. He got the data in one hour that would take months to get the hard way. This is what we call an unobtrusive study. A colleague of mine, Dushan Ashtari, we're working together on the what's called heritage language. Actually, he's driving the enterprise, doing very well. And we were very interested in a language spoken by children. Of, I'll give you the whole history. The language is Farsi. It's the language of Iran, Persia. Persian it used to be called, or still is called. And it's spoken as a first language throughout Iran. And she looked at families. She's been looking at families here in Southern California where they're lots and lots of Persian families, especially close to the area where she lives, Persian restaurants, etc., Persian television shows, all this. Do the kids speak Farsi? And she found that no, they know a little bit. First couple of years, the parents speak to them in Farsi, but they're not real good at it. And they're kind of apologetic and they have trouble talking to relatives when they call from Iran, etc. And uh, she found that the uh, Grown-ups blame the kids. She talked to a bookstore dealer, good example of a research method, very clear way of doing it. She talked to bookstore owners who had bookstores that had Persian books, books in Farsi. And do the, are the kids interested? See, they said, no, not really, until they get older. When they get older, they get a little interest in their family language and some of them want to try to acquire it. She looked at the books there, there's nothing for them to read. There's a classic literature. Rumi, for example, wonderful philosopher, but it's over the head of, you know, these people who don't know the language. And there's lots of grammar books. There's no way the bookstore is going to help them. She has brilliant evidence that shows they're not interested. She used a technique invented by our colleague, Jeff McQuillan. I mentioned him before. He invented a technique called wear and tear. He wanted to know if people were interested in self-help, teach yourself Spanish books. So you would think people would be very interested because Spanish is all over the United States. 
He went to a bookstore, or I'm sorry, to a library, pulled elementary Spanish books off the shelf, teach yourself Spanish, teach yourself Spanish, and there are a lot of them. And he looked at how many pages people had read by the dirt on the pages. If you turn the pages in a book, you're going to make a little mark on it if there are enough people doing it. And the page is going to be kind of crumpled up. It's not going to be as clean and neat as the pages that weren't read, especially 10, 20 people pick up the book and leaf through it. That gives you an idea of how far people got in these books. They had gotten through maybe 10, 15% of the book. That's all. Everybody gave up. These books are boring. Now, Mishan Ashtari did the same thing with books about Farsi, how to learn Farsi, etc. Mostly traditional, because that's all there were. It was even worse than the Quillen's results. I don't think people got beyond page five. This is this confirms that if you haven't acquired your heritage language, it's probably not your fault. There's nothing interesting for you to read, etc. That's the only books they had. And these were libraries and neighborhoods where there are lots and lots of families from Iran. So this was a very brilliant way of doing the research. Cheap, costs nothing. You don't bother people. You don't have to do expensive interviews, all this stuff. You get it right there. Okay, let's say you've done your study. By the way, the wear and tear study has been accepted for publication in a journal called Language Issues, and we're going to see if it can get out in other places. Um, and other papers will get out and similar. How about writing up a paper? Let me give you what I think is the way to do it. What they tell you, what I was told when I was new to this, if you've got a paper you're writing up, select the journal first. Look at all the journals and then write it in the style of the journal. I disagree 100%. That's like editing as you go and your mind is off the topic. Which journal? Forget it. Write the paper the way you want to write it that seems to be easiest and flows for you, that has an obvious organization. Then when you finish the, uh, the paper and you're happy with it, then look for a journal that's, that's doing things in your style. So you don't have to change it for some arbitrary journal requirements. So you're focused all the time on your work, not on making sure table one has these margins and the footnotes are done this way. First, write it up the way you like it in your own style. Then look for a journal that's close to your style and that has people reading it who are interested. Let me tell you now the secrets of writing a journal paper. <clears throat> Again, I have a hypothesis. This is for writing empirical papers with numbers, but it's also for writing opinion papers. I call this the central table hypothesis. In every quantitative journal, every quantitative journal paper, there is one table that is central. And if you're reading the journal paper, what everybody does is they look for that table. You don't start at the beginning and read the introduction because it's nearly always incomprehensible and boring. Look for that table where the results are there. Then you know what's going on. Then you read the paper. When you're doing research and you have your results, it could be the results of an experiment, of the, it could be the results of a questionnaire, write up your conclusions first what you have found the results first if they're tables make the tables first you write the results of your study first oh i found an interesting study in a journal this morning the title was great i was two-thirds through the article before i knew what the article was about it was all, he didn't get to the point ever. In fact, I gave up after a while. He's never going to tell me what this is about, what the results were, etc. Tell people up front what's going on. Do that table first. Make it stand out. When you're writing the introduction, tell them about it. Do the central table, then do the supporting tables. How, this, how old the subjects were, uh, whether they were left-handed, whatever is relevant. Then you write up the results. You're writing up the results first. You're not writing the introduction. You're not writing the conclusion. You're not writing the procedure. Do the results first. All the results have to do is explain what was in the table. Then 
you're nearly done. You get that table, it's all over. You, the hard part is over. Then you write up the procedure. We had 14 subjects, 13 of them came from Milwaukee, 12 from New York, blah, blah, blah. When you're done with that, you write the conclusion. Conclusions, oh, they're so frustrated. To me, <clears throat> the classic conclusion is, first of all, a short summary, which is a good idea. Then a section, people always put it in, called apologies. I call it apologies. What I did wrong and why you shouldn't, mea culpa, I did it wrong, why I shouldn't have done this and I should have done that, etc. And then the implications. The implications are usually people telling you what to do with the rest of your life. They're writing, here's what we did and here's what the next study should do. Here's what it means. Here's what your future research should be. I don't need this. I don't want it. I just want people to tell me their conclusions, not to confess all their sins and not to tell me how to lead my life. One paper I direct your attention to, the paper on the double helix. DNA won the Nobel Prize. It's magnificent. It's two pages long. That's it. It's published in the journal Nature. Look up Double Helix, Crick and Watson. You'll find it. It's all over the place on the internet. Their conclusion was one sentence. They said, it has not escaped our notice that our conclusions may have implications for this and that. That was it. This is written for professionals, not for people who don't know anything. If you're writing a journal paper, you're reading it, you're writing it for professionals who know the field. So you don't have to give them a history of the whole field. You don't have to give them everything. That brings me now, okay, that's the conclusion. Then you can write up the introduction. Do that last. Just what they need to know to frame your paper. All too often, people's introductions are really their dissertation, showing off how much they've read, their comments on everything. It's like a requirement to please their committee. No, you don't have to do that. Make it as short as you can. I believe now one of the reasons our field is so difficult is we write articles that are much too long. If you like to see some good, well, my papers are all very, very short. Um, I sometimes review papers for journals. I think it's a professional responsibility. They say, we've got a paper on reading. We'd like you to give us your opinion. I think that's okay. I think we should do this because people have reviewed my papers and it's been great. It's been very helpful. They found mistakes. They made comments, etc. My policy is, though, I tell journals, I will not review papers that are longer than five pages. I will not review papers that are longer than five pages. I have not reviewed any papers for six years. They're long, they're too long. They never get to the point. We can't get through the day if we have to read. Now, I have more time, I think, than just about anybody listening to this talk. I'm retired. Uh, I have all day to work, um, et cetera. Uh, especially with being at home, I have lots of time. I can't get through what's in the journals. I can't even come close to it. And, and I know the background, I'm a good reader. If I can't get through it, I, don't ex I can't see how other people do it because I have all the advantages. So we have to keep it short. You don't have to write a long history. You don't have to write all the implications, just enough. So those are the secrets, I think, for writing papers and enjoying it. I want for you, when you write a paper, to learn something new as you're doing it, to do authentic work that you are excited about, to be learning things as you're writing, not writing a long introduction that's boring, writing a long conclusion, so you're showing people that you've had read everything. Keep it short and you'll have more fun because you'll be thinking about your work most of the time. Uh, people in the fields that are experts, when you ask them do they like they work, mostly they say, I really enjoy it. Uh, people like me who are retired, most of us are still working. We're not getting promoted, nothing, but the work is so exciting, you can't wait. If you have to write these long, tedious papers, all the enjoyment is gone. Well, let's talk about rejection. No, not what happened to you with your girlfriend and boyfriend, but articles being rejected. Uh, people have the suspicion 
Articles are rejected because journals are just stupid and arbitrary and they don't get it. Well, that's actually kind of true. I think a lot of papers are unnecessarily rejected. Everybody gets rejected. People just don't talk about it. I'm happy to tell you about rejection. I get rejected probably as much as anybody. Uh, in the last three years, I think about half my papers, maybe more, were rejected right away. And I disagreed with the reviewers on most of them. Okay, I got them published somewhere else, didn't matter. Eventually you get it published. I'll tell you about one rejection. <laughs> I won't mention any names, Foreign Language Annals, the most important journal in foreign language education in North America. I wrote what I thought was one of the best papers I had ever done. It was about polyglots. Uh, people like Lomkato and Steve Kaufman, who've acquired 15, 18, 20 languages. And these are people I've met and talked to. I've read their books, I've talked to them at great length, and I got their secrets and it was fascinating. It's on my website, you can find it, Polyglot. I got it published in a Turkish journal. They did a nice job with it, it looks nice. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the reviewer sent it out to, <clears throat> the editor sent it out to people to review. The reviewers liked it except for one person. <clears throat> The one person said, well, Krashen has been uh, criticized a lot and he has not answered the criticisms. He should do that. I wrote back and said, no, that's not what this paper is about. My paper is an analysis of polyglots. It has nothing to do with some criticism that's 20 years old that I've already answered. Well, why don't you just mention them? No, keep the paper to the point. I withdrew the article. I count that as a rejection. So my article had nothing to, this happens in journals. Are they arbitrary? Yes. Oh, you want some, uh, you want, I'll give you a reason and some place where you can do therapy for yourself when you get rejected. All papers are sent to about three reviewers. All three have to love it or it won't get published. And the odds are very good that someone's gonna find something wrong that they disagree with. So this is why Journal papers are usually uncontroversial because people can't find anything to disagree with. People have to agree on it. So really bad papers get rejected. And I think sometimes some really creative papers, papers get rejected too. But don't worry, people do get um, published eventually. Um, I got a book for you to read. It's called Rotten Reviews. It's about famous authors who've been rejected and what they've said about it. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite uh, comment was by a guy named Howard Nemiroff, who was a very famous poet a few years ago. In fact, he was the poet laureate of the United States. And his comment was, I don't know what I did to those people all those years ago to make them so angry at me. Whatever it was, I wish I had done it harder. That's the best response I have ever seen. I should have been nastier to the reviewers. Well, you'd be interested in this. Peters and Sessie, brilliant paper, 1982. They looked at papers that had already been accepted in major journals. They resubmitted them to the same journals and changed the author's name. Of the 12 papers, nine were rejected. <laughs> And they were already well-known papers. That shows you <clears throat> that this is arbitrary and difficult. Here's what I say to do about it, my suggestion, and I'm gonna stop, we can talk about this. When, you are, when someone gives you feedback, take care of it right away. Don't let it sit. It's gonna, it's gonna, you'll get a bad, sour stomach from it. When you think about all these things, when I get a rejection or comments, that same day I drop everything, make more coffee and sit down and go through them slowly. Deal with them immediately. Some of the criticisms are right. You accept those and you make the changes. Great, and thanks to this reviewer. And you reject the ones you think are wrong, even if it means you won't get the paper published. Some people say, well, I had to include that, otherwise they wouldn't publish the paper. That is totally suicidal. You are going to be blamed for it. You're the author. You can't go around telling people, the reviewers made me do that. This happened to me once, uh, not that I heard the story. Uh, a colleague had written a really nice book, collected short stories, a book in, I think, French as a foreign language. 
And after each chapter, she had long lists of activities and questions. I said, why did you do this? All you need was the good stories. The publisher made me do it. Not the good reason. Have courage. I would rather not get a publication in a certain journal than to have things in it under my name that I don't agree with. So reject the ones you don't think are wrong. It's your paper. You are responsible for the content. Make sure you are comfortable with what's in it. My summary is now very simple. Uh, we now know what good writers do. From last time's talk, good writers know revision helps them come up with new ideas. They don't confuse revision with editing, okay? They are eager to revise their drafts. They have a plan, but they're happy to change them. This is what I said last time. They reread what they've written. They get new ideas. They delay editing until the end. They do incubation. They do incubation. They relax so they can come up with new ideas. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I've made the mistake. I take breaks all the time and I use breaks to clean up the office and stuff like that. I talked about this. Sometimes I go to the piano. That's a mistake. Because when I start playing the piano, I don't want to stop because that's more fun than anything. So it can't be too pleasant. You got to be some, do something that's, uh, do something that where you're happy to stop doing, go back to your work and just do a little of it. Regular writing. Keep regular hours. Don't wait till Saturday where you can work 10 hours and nothing over the week. Don't think about audience till your ideas have been worked out. Don't think about the journal till your ideas are worked out. Good academic writers, what do they do to summarize all this? They ignore deadlines. They focus on what they're doing. They write first to get some idea what their ideas are. They read narrowly. They don't try to keep up with the entire research. They come to their plan frequently to revise it when they read other people's research. They know that standard experiments are not the only game in town. There's other ways of doing research. They use other people's data, other people's tools, and they try to do unobtrusive studies that don't steal time from subjects. They don't worry about where to publish until it's all over. They deal with criticisms and rejections without delay right away. They accept the criticisms and comments that are helpful and they don't think about the ones that are not. I have one more comment about the past and looking at the past. A great uh, piece of work by Dean Keith Simonton, who has written several amazing books about creativity that are amazingly helpful. Simonton, he asks the question, People who are famous, who represent what we call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. Uh, who represents the zeitgeist of anthropology? Well, for a long time, it was Margaret Mead. Her work basically defined the field. She was considered the representative of fine thinking. In uh, linguistics, of course, it was Noam Chomsky. There's always one person like that. Would you say that these people are with the times or ahead of the times? Simonton's answer is surprising. Neither. They're behind the times. They're concerned with ideas that have been on their mind for a while. Uh, Simonton says, impressive thinkers are ruggedly independent of what the zeitgeist dictates for their generation. They don't do what's popular. They do what they are obsessed with, what's on their mind. They're oddly backward in looking in their ideas. They struggle to consolidate the ideas of the recent past into a grand overarching synthesis. Of course, I take a personal role here. Um, people say, oh, it's Krashen's research, that's old. Okay, let me tell you about the old research. Tell me any counters, oh, we want new research. Sometimes the new research is wonderful, sometimes it isn't. My advice, find out what you, examine yourself, are more interested in, pay attention to that, and you will be successful. Thank you very much. Do we have time for some discussion? Please prepare your questions. And I will prepare the answers in advance. Okay. <laughs> the 
questions in the chat, please. So Professor Krashen is going to read your question and answer them. Okay. Oh, the first question is here. <clears throat> it's where can we find your books? And what journals do you suggest we read? Good question. I don't write books anymore. I don't write books because they're too damn expensive. I don't subscribe to the regular journals. I can't afford it. And I don't know anybody who can afford it. Times have changed. These things are so expensive, they are destroying the profession. So we have a new policy. I'm not writing books, I'm writing articles. I'm making them as short as I can. And I'm giving them away for free. And that's what my colleagues are doing. I am at war with the publishers. I'm not playing their games anymore. The books are too expensive. They're poorly written. The articles are too long. And they're becoming less and less relevant to me because the people whose work I, defend, I depend on are doing the same thing I'm doing. Uh, I read stuff written by Jeff McQuillan. I read stuff written by Benico Mason. I'm starting to read more stuff by my new colleague, um, Nushan Ashtari. I'll read her stuff any day. Uh, I, I'm doing that. And that's where I'm getting my new information, not from the old stuff. So over time, you don't need to buy the expensive things. Every so often, I'm invited to submit an article to a collection. We're doing a collection on input. I'd like to submit an article. I look at the publisher. I see how much they charge for books. No, no one's going to read it. They won't be able to afford it. I wonder why they do it. I'm very cynical about these people. Lily Tomlin, comedian, says, my cynicism is having a hard time keeping up with the times. I think they do it to make money. Um, these books can cost, in American dollars, easily cost $100, $200, $300. They sell them to university libraries because the libraries feel obliged to get them. If they sell just to libraries at these outrageous prices, they make plenty of money. And the libraries have to subscribe to the journals. So they make plenty of money because they're so expensive. If you want to be a scholar, you have to be at a university where you have full use of the library or you can't be a scholar. I think scientific knowledge should be freely available to everybody and it doesn't cost anything. We're saving money. If Jeff McQuillan writes an article, I can read it for free. I don't have to buy the book. I don't have to write the, buy the journal, um, et cetera. I can get it. Benico Mason does an article. I can find it for free. It's great. It's not costing anybody anything. We're saving the university money. The publishers will go out of business. Too bad. I think they have to go into, they have to find an honest way of making a living. This is no longer an honest way. Not taking advantage of people with their budgets. Libraries are now on our side. More and more libraries are no longer subscribing to the journals. Uh, a British mathematician, a specialist in algebraic geometry, started this movement. And because of him, he says, I'm not publishing in the journals anymore. We're, you know, sharing papers, etc., using other ways. Uh, and you, big libraries stopped ordering mathematics journals. I publish in what are called open access journals. I mentioned this last time. This is what we should be reading. This is what we should be publishing in. Okay. So this is the revolution. It is soon going to take over. And oh, a colleague of mine in India, he's the editor of an open access journal. He published a major editorial in uh, the Hindu, a major Indian newspaper about the rise of these open access journals and free publication. So this is happening all over the world. That's what you should be reading. Don't go out and buy expensive books. I just saved you money. Okay. Sir, we have some questions in the chat. Are you going to read it by yourself? Did you get the questions? We can 
can't hear you. Can't hear you. Type it out. Okay. So you have nowadays universities require we write in games journal, which are considered the best ones. What do you think? Well, uh, repeat the question, please. Nowadays, universities require we write in gamers journal, which are considered the best ones. What do you think? I think it's all wrong, and it's up to me to say that in public, which I am doing now. And I'm hoping it will change. I'm doing everything possible to make that change. And I have written articles about this, which are on my website, sdcrashin.com, and I hope you will share them, why they need to be short, why they need to be simple, and why the journals should be free. Whenever I'm asked to review a paper, I always refuse because it's always too long, and I include these articles to the reviewers, and I've talked about them a lot. So take a look and share them, and maybe we can change the system. There is no solution. If you are required to publish in one of these journals, we've got to change it. We have got to change it. Okay, next. I would like to know why you think bilingual students are tip better or have deeper acquisition than students in all English programs? Well, that's what the research says. The research says that children in bilingual programs do better on tests of English. I can't change that. The reason it's true, <clears throat> let's say you have a child from Colombia, Chile, Mexico, comes to the United States and enters a program and the child speaks no English. If the program is all in English, child won't understand anything. But if in the beginning, the child gets a class in mathematics in Spanish, that gives him background knowledge. So when he takes Spanish and English, it's more comprehensible. He knows the topic, he knows the subject matter. And of course, you know from my last lectures that if you get the child listening to stories, the way Benico Mason tells stories, wonderful story listening, and you get them reading, and you get them excited about books, especially fiction, their English will improve very well, but not at the beginning. It takes a little time. While that's happening, give them some instruction in the primary language. I also think another reason for a primary language is for the good of the child, so they can communicate with their family. They can profit from the wisdom of members of the family. We've seen this in the United States over and over again. A child enters kindergarten with perfect Spanish acquires English. By the time they're in three, four years, five years for sure, high school, they can hardly talk to their abuelos. They can't talk to other members of the family. They have lost the primary language, which hurts you cognitively, hurts you academically, hurts you financially. There are only advantages to keeping the primary language. There are no disadvantages. Be bilingual, have both. It is a powerful asset. Thanks. Uh, where can we access the articles written and by the author you mentioned? Well, the only way to do it is to look at my articles and I will show you, you can, they'll be cited in my articles. They're in sdcrashen.com and uh, all my papers talk about this stuff all the time. You can find the access there. When I um, cite other people, some of them are published in the website called ResearchGate. Any author you want their paper, look at ResearchGate. Peter Elbow, one of my heroes, publishes, make sure his articles appear in ResearchGate. It's illegal, I'm sure, but if you get an article in one of these prestigious journals, send it to ResearchGate also, then I can read it. Otherwise, I can't read it. I remember when I, I started uh, but when I was grown up and I had to do my own tax return, there's a section where if you have professional expenses, you can deduct them from your taxes, okay? So if I spend $5,000 on professional books, I can take that, I can pay a little less taxes because of that. I have records of how much I was spending. It began $500, $1,000. Then I was spending five, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000 on publications alone. I can't afford it. Nobody has that kind of money. If we continue this way, it's the end of scholarship. So that's why ResearchGate is a great thing. That's why it's good that scholars make their papers available for free. 
minor at sdcrashen.com. And if you're on Twitter, you will see that I announce new articles all the time. Articles I've written, articles other people have written. So check it out and you'll be able to keep up pretty well. And in Chile for ESL classes, we need graded readers in electronic form. Paper books are a problem for us. Where can we get them? More and more. Um, stories, storiesfirst.org is starting to, storiesfirst.org is starting to post uh, stories in several languages. Um, there's stories in Spanish, stories in French, stories in one in Chinese. I wrote it. You have to read my story. Uh, and increasingly in English, English is the most important thing we're worried about now because English makes a huge difference for just about everybody in the world. More and more of these things will be online. And if you, if you, what's really nice is older literature like grim fairy tales are all available for free because they're old. If they start getting simplified, we our problems are solved. So there's no one who's going to sue you for posting a fairy tale. Okay, you can do that and you can simplify it. Someone can do that and put it there for free. People will download it. This is starting to happen by various groups. Good sign. Okay. Um... The articles we write are of more than 15 pages, usually 20. Do you think is it better to write in a blog? No, because I won't read it if it's 20 pages. Try to write shorter papers, please. I cannot read a 20 page paper. It's never worthwhile for me. Every time I see a paper like that, you can do the same thing in three pages. You don't have to tell people everything you know in one paper make it short and clear you don't need every detail just the main points if you must write a long paper sure make it a blog but try to keep it short not only nobody has money we know that but nobody has time because we're all trying to just survive this day and age because of the economic tragedy that has happened all over the world thanks to donald trump for the most part okay who's made these things happen for no reason at all there, I said it. I'm glad. Okay. Where do you publish your articles? Is it useful to have our own website and publish there? Uh, I don't think people are going to read it. Um, I don't publish things. Uh, I make my art. My articles are published in open access journals. Then I link them to my website. You can find them from my website. Do that. Find open access journals. Go to Google, type in open access, and you'll find them where you can publish fiction, nonfiction, etc. And then on your website, provide links to them. And get on Twitter. Can you get Twitter in Chile? Twitter is wonderful. And use it as a place to tell other people what you're doing. Keep it short. Um, what is the two page article you suggested that we read? Um, do the one, uh, it's called the double helix, something like that. The authors are Crick and Watson, C R I C K W A T S O N. And it's, it's some, the title is something about the double helix and it's easy to find on Google type in double helix, Crick Watson. You'll find this two page paper. And you won't understand all of it. It's about chemistry, it's about uh, biology, but you'll see what they do and the style they use. And take a look at mine. You'll see some of them are short and easy to read. I recommend an article called Why We Should Write Short Papers. Thanks. Uh, you talked about teachers' experiences as a very important data. What do you think about teachers being unbiased about their teaching experience? How could we as researchers tag the truth? Well, that's the way to good question. The way we know whether it's a legitimate answer is if we see a lot of them. If you have 10 papers and nine of them come to similar conclusions and the last one is just making things up, doing funny things, you know that's not right. 
The trick is to have a lot of them, and you can only read a lot of them if they're short, otherwise you can't. Short papers makes life easy for everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Krashen for all the ideas he has been enlightening us with. One idea that is important to me is that regarding the required transformation our research activity needs, not only for improving some hypothesis, but also trying to think our own realities uh, in order to make it better with that we may find in the activity. What do you think? Agreed. <laughs> Absolutely. There's several, we don't just write to report new stuff. We like people to reflect on what's going on and give their insights, make suggestions, etc. cetera. Uh, we need all the help we can get. We need to share ideas. Out there among the teachers is so much brilliance. Oh my gosh. Things that professors like me never think about. You have to have the day-to-day -day experience and yeah, I could take 10 years and start teaching. I wouldn't know what you guys know. So I encourage this kind of reflection, no question. Uh, this is a question about bilingualism. My husband and I are, my husband and I are both English teachers. We have a four year old boy. We live in Mexico and we try to raise him as a bilingual. I speak to him in English every time we are together. However, we notice my kids struggles with verb tense highly. Is this a characteristic of communicative performance among children at the age whose native language is English? Well, I'd have to look at uh, what kinds of mistakes he made. Most likely they are typical of children. And it could be because he has slightly reduced input that acquisition will be a little bit slower in certain areas. There's a magic cure. The magic cure is tell him stories, read him stories, get him excited about comic books, get him excited about reading. If he becomes a voluntary reader, self things he selects, he's going to be great. His English is going to be perfect, not a problem. Thank you, sir. Um... Have you written any article about the use of slang in the classroom for second language learners? Can this fasten the, fasten the acquisition of L2? I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Uh, have you written any article about the use of slang in the classroom for second oh, language the learners? Slang. The use of slang. I wouldn't worry about it one way or the other. If it happens to come up, usually today's slang that's used is some of it's going to disappear, some of it has part of the language. It's a small percentage of what they hear. I don't worry about their using it. I don't worry about occasionally teachers using it. As long as it's respectable language, it's fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Good. Stories. I used, Stories. Go ahead. <laughs> I used to believe phonics instruction was helpful for reading, but then I had to teach it and I hate it. Children are able to read isolated words, just like you said, but they don't understand them. Uh, so, can they improve their reading comprehension skill later? I think a little bit of phonics is not harmful. Basically, initial consonants, and that's really all you need. The alphabet, just a little bit, all the rest you get from understanding what's on the page. If they read for pleasure, they don't need much phonics. They need to understand, that's all. All the complicated phonics, all the hard rules are going to be there. They will be acquired. They won't be learned, but they'll be acquired. For example, the example I just gave you, B, in the word bomb, the first B is pronounced B. The second B, is silent. We just say bum. What's the rule? Nobody knows. I've asked a thousand people. I know the rule, but I had to look it up. It turns out if M comes before B, then the B is silent, but not always. How about bombardier? There it's pronounced. It depends on what kind of ending. Nobody knows these things. 
I didn't know these things. They are acquired. All of us have acquired this rule. None of us have learned it. Phonics instruction, 99% of it is a cruel waste of time. Okay, that's all for today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for answering all the questions. Thank you everybody for attending. And I would like to say thanks again, Professor Krashen. It has been a real pleasure, a real honor. And we are also happy to, to have a lot of teachers from different schools, from different universities Wonderful. in Chile, in Mexico, Ecuador, New Zealand, the states and, and some of the countries, Paraguay, Uruguay today. So here is almost all Latin America <laughs> present to hear you and thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Very good. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. You will receive your certificate. Okay. Okay. Bye, sir. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe.